raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, the daughter of Iranian immigrant parents who brought her up speaking Persian in the family home. Uh, after completing her BA in history at UC Davis, she spent a year in Tehran studying Persian and Arabic at the Dehuda Institute before returning to the US to pursue her PhD at University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Dr. Ahmadi received numerous awards during her graduate studies, including a graduate student prize from the Association of Middle East Women's Studies in 2018. Her research has focused on the Iran-Iraq war, culminating in several publications, including a 2018 article in Film International entitled, The Basiji Must Die, War Trauma in the Films of Ebrahim Hatam Kaya. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Shahrzad to you, and I'm sure you will enjoy her presentation. I wanna thank Cynthia for that wonderful introduction. I want her to introduce me everywhere all the time. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I would do it. <laughs> and thank you, Jeremy, for sharing more information about Iran Culture Week. Um, I'm sure a lot of the attendees will be eagerly participating or attending um, some of those events. So thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. It is such a pleasure to be here with all of you. And as, um, I know as, um, I wouldn't say frustrating, but as distancing as it might be not to be present for a presentation, um, I do wanna express my enormous gratitude for everyone to zoom in and take the time out of their evening to do this. Um, and I really do look forward to hearing your thoughts on the presentation um, and having a discussion with you about the topic of Iranian cinema, which I know people are very interested in. Um, I'm actually going to be focusing on the history of Iranian cinema. As Cynthia alluded to, I'm a historian. So um, what I'm interested in is the beginnings of things and the developments of things. So uh, when I hear someone say, well, it's very interesting that X, Y, or Z is the case, I want to know why it's the case and when it started being the case. Um, and the thing that I was most interested in for this talk when I originally pitched it was I wanted to discuss or explore the relationship between Iranian cinema and Iranian nationalism. That was sort of, I thought it would be an interesting topic for people to think about. And as I was writing and as I was doing my own kind of personal exploration about what I enjoy reading about Iranian cinema, I started to think about the, um, the dichotomy between elite cinema and popular cinema because that's a subject that a lot of people are aware of. It's something that exists across all cinemas. Um, it often illustrates the divides within a nationalism, within a society. And the other issue that I was interested in was what is it about Iranian cinema? What, um, what it, within Iranian cinema is actually not terribly Iranian? How much of it is domestic? How much of it is international? Um, how much of it is playing to international audiences. And I wanted to understand when that all started, because we often talk about Iranian cinema as an international endeavor in the post-revolutionary period. Iranian cinema blew up and became the cinema we know and love today. But was there a time when Iranian cinema was uniquely its own? It was just its own domestic cinema. Um, and what were the divides then between the avant-garde and the popular cinema? And this presentation is gonna be chronological. I'm taking you through time. I'm beginning with the Qajar period a little bit because I think it illustrates some of the themes that I'm trying to get at. Um, but those are the, the major topics. Um, and within that, we're gonna be talking about gender roles. We're gonna be talking about class. We're gonna be talking about all kinds of things, but that's sort of the anchor of this presentation. So I wanna sort of begin at the beginning, which is like, when did Iranians start watching movies? When did that start happening? Um, the very first Iranian who watched a movie was uh, a guy named Ebrahim Khan Akhosbosh Sonia Saltaneh. And names in the Qajar period are so long, I'm just going to call him Al Saltaneh from now on. Um, and he watched his first movie in 1897 in Britain. And he was amazed. He was astonished. And he thought, I want to do this. I'm a professional printer and I'm a, I take photographs professionally for the royal court, but this is what I really want to be doing. 
Now, he didn't have the money to do it then, uh, and it wouldn't be for another three years until uh, he went on a European trip with his immediate boss, the Shah of Iran at the time, Mozaffar al-Din Shah. Um, he went on a trip with him through Europe in 1900 for the Universal Exhibition, where Iran's uh, national heritage was also being exhibited. And at that exhibition, Mozaffar al-Din Shah saw a movie. And he was sitting in an amphitheater and he was amazed by what he saw, just like Al Saltana had been. And he turns to Al Saltana and says, you have to buy two cameras today and you have to bring every movie that we can get our hands on and bring it back to Iran so we can watch them. And that was the beginning. It was 1900, Al Saltana comes to Iran. He starts uh, filming, he starts, um, uh, splicing movie or splicing photographs and adding Persian intertitles so that uh, the court could read what was happening. Um, and he starts, you know, making basically what would be like a makeshift laboratory uh, and became kind of an early film entrepreneur. Of course, he was in a really unique position because he didn't have to worry about funding. The court was funding him and he was producing whatever it was the court wanted him to produce. Um, I'm going to be calling this statist cinema, so cinema that pleased the state, cinema that the state wanted produced. What did Mozaffar al-Din Shah really want produced? He loved burlesque, he loved comedy. Um, most of what al-Saltana was, in fact, Mozaffar al-Din Shah himself also made movies. He would film court jesters playing practical jokes on each other. Um, he loved seeing like magic acts, things appearing out of nowhere on film. And so that's most of what Al Saltana was doing. He was trying to amuse Mozaffar al-Din Shah. But other film producers, there were lots of Iranians traveling through Europe at this time. They weren't doing that. They weren't playing to the Shah. They wanted to produce something that um, was different, was not court cinema. And the person I'm going to contrast Al Saltana to is a man whose name is also somewhat long, um, Ibrahim Khan Sahof Boshi Tehrani. I'm going to just call him Tehrani. And Tehrani was making uh, his own movies. He had been to Europe, he had seen movies, and he said to himself, Well, why can't I do this in Iran? Why can't I open up a little theater in Iran? Now his experience of movies in Europe, he describes as very sort of uh, gritty, the underbelly of European society. He goes to what he describes as a coffee house, probably a cafe or a restaurant. Um, he's picked up by a woman. Uh, he describes drinking at the cinema theaters. He describes prostitution. That association between cinema and illicit activity begins in 1900. It begins at the beginning. And Tehrani comes to Iran thinking of cinema in this way, that it is gritty, that there is something dangerous about it, but that's exciting. He likes that excitement. So what does he do? He has an antique shop in uh, Tehran and he decides, I'll put up a screen in my backyard. I'll invite people for you know, whatever they have to come and see it. And we'll call it a, a movie theater. And he ends up being the person who opens the very first popular publicly attended cinema in Tehran in 1904 called um, Cherokh Gaz Street Cinema. Now, um, cinema spaces themselves were dangerous. Why? anyone could go. People of different classes, people of different ethnicities. In fact, from the very beginning, cinema was very multicultural. Uh, the early uh, contributors to cinema in Iran were actually minorities. And that is something that, um, that I just saw a question by Puran. Um, how long? I believe we're, at, we're an hour, right? I just want to actually say it for everyone. I think it's useful information to know. That's a good question. <laughs> um, so uh, early on, there was 
tremendous participation from Iran's minority community. Al Saltana himself was actually the son of a Baha'i. Um, and I'm going to be talking a lot about Armenians who participated in cinema. This was something that was from the beginning, like I said, multicultural. Now, I'm going to just finish up Tehrani's story. Um, Tehrani himself was a democratizing influence. He wanted everybody to enjoy cinema. He was involved in the Constitutional Revolution of 1905. He was in uh, constitutional societies. And his cinema was shut down within one month of opening. This was the first instance of um, censorship of cinema in Iran. And it started with the very first popular cinema that opened. And uh, this is something that I wanted to begin with, because like I said, I think it illustrates a lot of the themes that we're going to be talking about. And Al Saltana and um, Tehrani represent two of the kind of like stereotypical characters in Iranian cinema. One is sort of appealing to the popular, is interested in doing something that's outside the purview of the state, is punished for doing so. Um, and the other is defining the bounds of acceptability. The other is playing to the court. And this is gonna remain true until, um, well, throughout the Pahlavi period, but it begins really early. I'm moving to the Reza Shah period, the Pahlavi period. And this is, um, we're gonna be talking mostly here about the first talkie, the lore girl. This is a great movie, it's available on YouTube and I encourage uh, everybody to watch it. Um, for those of you who uh, are Persian speakers you'll, or from Iran originally, you'll notice that the lore girl actually has an incredibly strong accent that's not from Loristan at all. She's from Kerman, which posed a problem for the, um, the producer and director of the movie. But I'm going to be talking mostly here about um, pro-state cinema, which is what uh, Reza Shah's cinema was. Um, virtually everything produced in this period was pro-state. And I'm also going to be talking about the articulation of a new female model in the Pahlavi period and the tension between the on-screen model and the off-screen treatment of actresses. And what that tells us about this strong association between Western culture and the cinema itself. That although this movie, The Lore Girl, was presented as a strongly nationalistic Iranian movie, it's the first Iranian film where you could hear people speaking in Persian, it was very exciting. Nevertheless, the actress in the movie was treated abysmally because um, Iranians conceived of Western women as promiscuous, as um, sort of unable to offer faithful companionship. And therefore, a woman playing in a movie had to be that way. Otherwise, why would she do it? So uh, before I talk about the lore girl, I want to talk about another movie, an Armenian, a movie produced by an Armenian family. Um, and the reason I want to talk about this movie is because I want to talk about the relationship between cinema and politics in Pahlavi Iran. Um, the film is called Mr. Haji, the Movie Actor, and it's produced in 1933. It's, it's produced by, directed by a man named um, Ovanis Ohanyan. And Olvanis Ohanyan had decided that he wanted to make a movie with an unveiled woman. And this was the very first feature length film with an unveiled woman. And it preceded the law passed by Reza Shah in 1936, decreeing that women should not wear the veil. The unveiling of Iran, the great women's awakening of 1936. This anticipates that. And in a way, Ohan Yan is introducing to moviegoers the idea that women could appear in public without a veil, that women could be active agents in a film. And part of the way he was able to get away with, part of the reason he was able to get away with this is because the woman who appeared on screen was Armenian, she was Christian. And so she was not beholden to the same Islamic strictures. And the early participation of, of Armenians in Iranian cinema did a tremendous amount in reforming Iranians' understanding of what a woman could look like, 
what a woman could be, and this was happening on screen. In 1934, a year later, Abdul Hossein Sepanta's The Lore Girl is released. This was a very anticipated movie because like I said, it was the first talkie. And like the movies I'm gonna be talking about as we move forward, it was funded by an international agency. It was not funded by Iranians. It was not funded by the state. It was actually funded by the Imperial Film Company in Bombay. Um, Abdul Hossein Sepanto had been living in India since 1927. Uh, and he had met a lot of Parsis, Zoroastrian Indians who had a deep connection to Iran and wanted very much to introduce themselves to Iranians. They wanted to show Iranians what kind of civilization they had built in India. And they wanted to show Iranians that they could be just as great as the Parsis in India. If only they would listen to Reza Shah, if only they would support him. The Parsis were very supportive of, of the Pahlavi monarchy. So Sepanta decides to embark on making this movie, The Lore Girl, and the movie is all about the lawlessness of the pre-Pallavi period. It's about World War I, uh, immediately after World War I when the country is falling apart and um, the main character, the lore girl, her name in the movie is Golnar. Uh, she's been kidnapped by bandits. The main character, Jaffa, who's played by Sepanta himself, helps rescue her. And how does he rescue her? Where does he take her? He takes her to India. And when they get to India, it's so beautiful and it's so advanced and it's so modern. And they're really happy there. They become a very bourgeois couple there. She's playing the piano. They're both dressed in very European style. And they read in the newspaper that Reza Shah has taken over Iran and Jaffa turns to Golnar and says, we have to go back. The nation is emerging. We have to go and support our nation. It's not gonna be lawless the way it was before. I want to talk here about the a couple of things. So obviously it's being produced by an outside force, by Parsis, who are um, who have their own interests in what they want presented here. But another thing is the fact that the movie is in a way resembling Sepanto's own life. He left Iran because it was very bad. He left actually after Reza Shah took over. So there's some deceit there. And um, like the main character in the movie, Sepanta does go back to Iran because of Reza Shah. In 1935, Sepanta returns and finds that Reza Shah is not interested in him, that the Pahlavi monarchy is not interested in sponsoring his movies. They're not interested in cinema. He goes to the theaters. They're not interested in giving him any cut in the proceeds that they made from screening the movie. And he ends up becoming very poor in Iran. Um, and dies in the 1960s in relative obscurity. He had actually begun to write about cinema, but he did not produce many movies, although the majority of the talkies in the 30s were, were made by Sepanta. After the 30s, it's pretty much over for him. I wanna then turn to the woman who played the lure girl, and her name was Ruhangi's Sami Nejad. And Sami Nejad was a very young girl when she was cast in this movie. And she becomes the very first female Iranian star. There had never been anyone like that before. Tremendous excitement about her. Everyone could recognize her. Her um, accent, which was actually a Kermani accent, became very played up and very um, sort of endearing and, and famous. But at the same time, remember, uh, cinema was associated with the West. And what kind of woman goes to the cinema a promiscuous woman, a woman who might engage in prostitution, a woman who um, is part of that, like I said, gritty underbelly of European society. And that is immediately projected onto her. As a very young girl, she's labeled a prostitute. She can hardly go anywhere. She's constantly sexually harassed. She ends up changing her name and moving to Tehran. And again, becoming a very obscure character and disappearing from cinema. Now, the impression of actresses and of cinema itself as being sexually illicit and dangerous will accelerate in the Pahlavi period, where tabloids and gossip columns and the culture of stardom really starts to like develop um, around the 1960s. 
So I'm going to move into the um, Muhammad Reza Shah period. So first to understand why things become much more standardized and much more globalized in this period is first to understand how Muhammad Reza Shah comes to power. He comes to power in 1941. His father is overthrown for flirting uh, a little bit too much uh, with the Germans. Uh, his father ends up dying in South Africa. And Mohammed Reza Shah comes to power fully supportive of the Allied forces, uh, which had occupied Iran. And as a result of the occupation of the Soviets and the Americans, Iranian cinema completely transforms. It becomes really a state venture. At this point, we have, um, especially the Americans, both the American government and a team from Syracuse come and basically create the Ministry of Culture. They create uh, various departments of um, cinema and universities. They create uh, really a, a film infrastructure for Iran. Now, of course, for the United States and for the Soviet Union, Cold War interests are really dominating their uh, investment in Iranian cinema. And it's seen as a kind of pipeline um, of American interests communicated to Iranians in their own language through Iranian filmmakers. And here, like my comparison of Sa al Saltana and of Tehrani, I'm going to be comparing two really important characters in the Pahlavi period um, in terms of filmmaking. And the first is a very famous um, filmmaker, artist, writer by the name of Ebrahim Golestan. And the second is a lesser known character, but incredibly important in Pahlavi cinema, meaning state cinema. And his name is Mohammed Ali Isari. And I'm gonna start with Isari. Iranian cinema at this point had become outward facing. Um, documentaries being produced in Iran were now being screened abroad. People wanted to know like, who, what is this Iran? Like, what is this place that um, we're so heavily invested in that's part of our, um, our geopolitical, um, that's very much tied to our geopolitical interests in the Middle East. So the movies being produced in the 40s and 50s had this incredible import for Mohammad Reza Shah because they were being viewed internationally. That wasn't totally new. Um, a lot of you who are interested in Iranian cinema, I'm sure have seen or heard of the movie Grass, which was uh, Grass, a nation's battle for life. It was um, produced in 1925. I believe the same people who made King Kong actually made this. They kind of traveled through Iran, filming uh, their experiences of the Bakhtiar tribe. Um, a lot of of uh, allusions to Aryanism, and this is where we came from as a people, the Europeans came from a place like this, and look at this migratory tribe. Reza Shah was not thrilled with this movie because it made Iran look like a tribal country, which it was. Um, but this problem of what Iran looked like abroad became much stronger for Muhammad Reza Shah, his son. Um, and I, one of the biggest scandals in this respect happened in uh, 1959, a movie called A Mother for Shamsi, which was made using footage by um, the filmmaker, Muhammad Ali Isari. So I wanna talk a little bit about Isari, who's just like the Al Saltana character I opened up with. Isari had attended a college that was built and managed by British missionaries. He was very fond of Europeans. Um, he started his film career during World War II. He worked as the assistant films officer for the British Embassy Information Department uh, and later for the British Council in Tehran, where he organized film screenings. He was actually a very known character in the 50s um, uh, doing organizing film screenings for the British. Now, in 1955, he moves from working for the British to working for the Americans. And this is very emblematic of, of the landscape in Iran at the time. Uh, Iran was moving from firmly in the sort of British Anglosphere to the American Anglosphere. And he starts working for the United States Information Service or the USIS. And the USIS was responsible for creating 
a lot of the sort of ministry of, you know, ministry of culture, departments of university, especially University of Tehran, their kind of film department and their infrastructure came from the USIS. Uh, Isari was the person responsible for newsreels. In fact, if you grew up in Iran in the 1950s and 60s, about 90% of newsreels were produced by Isari. Um, he directed and co-directed many documentaries. He was very supportive of the Pahlavi monarchy's westernization project. So what is this a mother for Shamsi? Why did it become so famous? It was considered, quote, the most disgraceful film shown about Iran abroad, end quote, by uh, actually left-wing magazines, which you would think would be sort of supportive of, of shedding a light on um, Iran's poverty. Isari had uh, footage of a very, very poor Jewish village or Jewish community, which he had not used for anything. And he put it in the stock footage in Tehran and forgot all about it in the early 50s. In 1958, uh, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Com Com Committee had access to that footage, took it off the shelves, and produced a movie from it. And they credited Isari for the footage because they'd gotten it from him. That movie was then shown and Iranians were mortified. It showed an extremely poor Jewish family struggling in the most abject poverty. Uh, it showed really a community in dire circumstances. People were very embarrassed. And from the perspective of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, it, it was a good representation of um, of where the Iranian Jewish community was and the necessity of contributing help to them. There was a real necessity there. In fact, it was very rare to see footage like this. This is one of the very few examples of footage like this that we have. This almost destroyed Isari's career. Because of globalization, because of Iran's entanglement with um, the United States, to a lesser extent with the Soviet Union earlier in the 40s, because of the interconnected nature of Iran with the West, it became very dangerous to either produce, direct, or even have footage of something that's stocked because anyone had access to it and could do whatever they wanted with it. Um, the Shah did not want to present this kind of image to the West. And um, it had a really stifling consequence on the creativity of filmmakers in the Pahlavi period. For those of you who are interested in Iranian cinema, you'll note that very rarely do people interested in Iranian cinema talk a lot about the Pahlavi period. There's a reason for this. Um, it was very limiting what you could do. Isari is a great example. Somebody who was sponsored, funded, totally supported by the state, had nothing to do with the creation of this movie, was still out of commission for many months because of this episode. So I want to then turn to the person I'm contrasting him with, his contemporary, his peer, a man named Ebrahim Golestan. And Golestan uh, was one of the most serious and significant filmmakers of the Pahlavi period. Um, there are several who were able to parlay their careers into the post-revolutionary period. Um, Dayush Mehjoui is one of those people. He also made movies pre-revolution and post-revolution. Um, Golestan leaves Iran. Uh, so he doesn't do that, but is a very important um, filmmaker. Um, I want to focus on Golestan, but also his longtime lover, a very famous woman poet by the name of Furuk Farokhzad. Um, now, Golestan, although Isar's, Isari's contemporary, approaches politics totally differently. Isari had gotten his start doing what? Working for the British, working for the British Embassy, working for the Information Service of the British, and then moving on to the United States Information Service. Golestan uh, begins his career in the, as a journalist in, the, in Iran's Communist Party, in the Tudeh Party. Sort of disillusioned by politics, he moves on. He decides, what if I made movies for the Anglo-Iranian oil company? I bet I could make a lot of money doing that. And in fact, the oil company for a long time had been a major sponsor of movies because they wanted to show all the nice things that the Anglo-Iranian oil company was doing for the, the immediate region it was extracting oil from. 
So Golestan starts working for them. He's making very good money. And he decides, well, what if I made my own workshop? I'll call it the Golestan Film Workshop. And various directors and producers can come to my workshop, learn from me, I can learn from them. And we can have kind of a community of avant-garde filmmakers coming out of this workshop. So for a year, he worked with the Anglo-Iranian oil company, saved up tons of money, stopped working with them, and then started to really invest in his own ventures. In my opinion, the best movie of the Pahlavi period is, is a movie called uh, Mud, Brick, and Mirror, was produced in 1965. The kind of workshop element of this, this amazed me when I uh, read it in graduate school because I'd watched the movie many years ago. I thought it was phenomenal. And then I read in graduate school that he had uh, literally written the dialogue a day or two before every day of shooting. Like the actors did not know what the dialogue was going to be when they showed up on camera. And, and it's a phenomenal film, but yes, there is this workshop element. He didn't think of it as a studio. He thought of it as an opportunity for everyone to get involved in the production of a film. Um, now that workshop also produced some of the, uh, uh, some incredible documentaries. It was actually founded as a documentary workshop. Furur Efar Ochsad, who was his, um, a uh, lover companion, um, was also a multi-talented person, very famous uh, poet. And she made movies for GFW. Her most famous is a movie called The House is Black. I uh, also recommend this movie. It's a, a documentary about um, a leper colony near Tabriz. It's unique in terms of documentaries because the the colony that she's highlighting that like invited her to come and show the world what amazing work they're doing. She's actually very critical of them. Doesn't think that they're doing this incredible work, which um, is sort of uh, illustrates the kind of realism, the humanism of her um, documentaries. She also ends up adopting a young boy from that movie. Um, it's something interesting to think about as you're watching it, her own personal connection to the film. Um, now, I use Isari and Golestan to make explicit the kind of statist, maybe outside the purview of the state. Um, Golestan's movies were definitely under a lot of attack by the Pahlavi monarchy, who were not happy with what he was producing. Um, but he was trying to push the envelope and acceptability. Now, here is an, an artist, Isari, who's making movies for the state. Here is Golestan, who's making movies for, um, you know, maybe someone who's really knowledgeable about film and wants to really go into experimental film. What about someone like my mom, growing up in Iran, who was from a very working class background, could not care less about a Golestan, could not care less about the sort of uh, elite genre of film coming out. What were they watching? Well, they were watching a genre of film called Film Farsi. And film Farsi cinema uh, was considered popular cinema. The dialogue was actually much like Golestan, where they were writing the dialogue like the day before. The same thing is happening with film Farsi, but the people are not very talented. So they're writing very bad dialogue the day before. A lot of the movies were exact replicas of, of movies that were popular in Iran. Uh, Bollywood was very popular in Iran. So a lot of these movies were replicas of those movies. Um, they were replicas of Hollywood movies. Um, repetitive plots, very quick turnaround, script would be sent, film would be shot within a couple of months. And it started to really feed into a culture of stardom. So we have the gossip columns, the magazines, the tabloids. Um, there are very, very important gender dynamics that I'm going to be discussing briefly here. Um, the most famous film Farsi produced, in my view, is a movie called Qaisar, or Caesar. And it's the movie that I show my students when I wanna talk about popular Iranian cinema, when I wanna talk about gender. It illustrates a lot of the themes of um, sort of the male, the idealistic male character, the idealistic female character. Um, it's part of a genre of film called Jahidi film, which is a, a form of male, mas a form of traditional masculinity that was very vaunted during this period. So the kind of traditional man who 
uh, if something happens to his sister, he's not going to go to the cops. He's going to take care of it himself. And that's what the movie Caesar is all about. It's about a guy whose sister is raped. She kills herself. And now it's his responsibility to take care of it. And throughout the movie, the police keep appearing and saying, this cannot go on like this. We can't have people going after their own personal vendettas. They need to come to us. But as, this, as the viewer, you're sympathetic to Reza. You want him to be successful. You feel bad for his plight. You think that modern society just doesn't understand him. That's the whole point. Um, this was a real masterpiece by a very famous film director called Masoud Kimiai, who also is, uh, was able to parlay his career from the pre-revolutionary to the post-revolutionary period. Um, very prolific filmmaker. What the movie was criticized for, however, was its touristic view, its exoticization of Iran, its eye for the foreigner who doesn't know much about Iran. And this is something that's going to become particularly pronounced, again, in the post-revolutionary period. This is not new to the post-revolutionary period, although the criticism is much deeper and much more sort of full-throated. But this was definitely something that filmmakers were concerned with before the revolution. The Shah was concerned what movies are being watched abroad. Remember Isari's movie? And film critics were concerned. Are we making movies for us? Or are we making movies for other people? What is the point of our cinema? Um, now, I talked for a moment about gender. Um, in Reza, you have a very stark representation of the traditional strong male character. Um, we call him in Persian the Luti. Uh, this could be a negative connotation or a kind of positive connotation, depending on the person using it and what context it's being used. The really negative male character is the dandy. It's the man who's trying to be Western, who doesn't really have a sense of self, who is imitating, not authentic. Um, but for female characters, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, the vast, well, not vast majority, I'll say the percentages in a minute. I'd, well, maybe I should just give it away. 40% of women represented in pre-revolutionary Iranian cinema played uh, a sex worker of some kind. That's enormous. I mean, that's like very impressive. So they were either a dancer or a cabaret worker or a prostitute. There were actually just as many prostitutes represented in Iranian cinema before the revolution as there were housewives represented. That's remarkable. Um, so the, the female character in film Farsi was very typically negative, um, was the sort of character who was responsible for the overstimulation, over-sexualization of Iranian society. Um, one of my favorite film Farsi movies that I want to recommend to people is a movie called Dar M. Tedada Shab. And uh, it was produced in 1978. It feels almost like a mea culpa of the Iranian cinema film Farsi industry. Um, the main character played by the superstar of the time, her name was Gugush. Um, she plays herself, absolutely herself. Uh, she plays a woman who had a child and didn't really raise the child, who left the child with her husband. Her husband was once her partner. Her, her first husband in real life was a cabaret owner who worked with her. Um, she, in the movie, is constantly saying what a terrible mother she is, that her career comes before her child. Um, she's having a lot of promiscuous sex, but she's not enjoying any of it. She's really miserable. Uh, she drinks too much. And she has this really young fan who's in love with her, who kind of represents every young boy fan of Gugush. And he's so disappointed by who she is in real life. Um, and the whole movie is a sort of apology to that character, to that person. Um, we're sorry that we don't uphold the ethical standards of society. We're sorry that we're, we do drugs. We're sorry that we have sex. We're sorry that these things happen. This movie was produced the year before the revolution. Remember I said that the movie by Ohanian, the Armenian movie, anticipated the unveiling in 1936. When I watch this movie, I really feel it anticipates the revolution. There are so many underlying tensions within the film. 
Um, and here I want to transition to revolutionary cinema. And you'll find that we're like almost out of time. We're, <laughs> I have to really wrap this up now. Um, but I'm moving to revolutionary cinema to say that, because uh, I do want, are we doing, Cynthia, are we doing Q&A? Like, is that, okay, we're doing, okay, good. So I'll actually wrap this up really quick and then maybe the questions will be about this. And then I can expound more on the presentation here. But after the revolution, we have a kind of proliferation of experimental cinema, of, of movies produced and directed by women. Um, as I said earlier, a huge proportion of female characters in um, Iran, pre-revolutionary Iranian cinema were um, sex workers of some kind or, or involved in sex work in some capacity. Uh, after the revolution, we have incredibly strong female directors like Tahmina Milani, um, Rakhshan Bani Etemad, and they're making movies about women. They're adding tremendous nuance to the character of women. Um, in fact, Milani is a good example of someone who kind of flips everything upside down, where the male character is really negative and very brutish and very aggressive, and the female character is very pure and very good and just trying to make it all work out somehow. Um, we have a real challenge to patriarchal authority, and it's not just coming from female directors, although they often pay the, the greatest price for that kind of uh, societal criticism. Milani, of course, famously, um, was hugely punished for her work. Um, but there, these filmmakers are interested in exposing what life is really like in Iranian society. And this really happens after Ayatollah Khomeini dies in 1989. Between 1980 and 1989, cinema was very different. We can talk about that in the Q&A if you're interested in Iran-Iran war um, cinema, which is actually what I've done research on mostly. Um, but after 1989, we have a lot of this experimental cinema. Um, and it begs the question, is this cinema produced for Iranians or is it produced for an international audience? Iranians often call this festival cinema. So it's not really about the art and it's not really about Iranians. It's really about winning awards on the international film circuit. Um, and that tension is very much there among directors who feel that certain directors have sold out to the West and they're not really interested in Iranian audiences anymore. But what I wanted to do in this talk was say that, that there never was a pure domestic Iranian cinema. Iranian cinema was from the very beginning concerned with what the West thought, was very concerned with the representation of Iran, and was always creating a kind of fantasy, a kind of facade. So when Sepanta created the Lore Girl, he had a fantasy of what Iran could be for himself. And it wasn't that when he got there. Um, virtually all of these directors and filmmakers are in a way creating a version of Iran uh, Ohanian in 1933 is creating an unveiled version of Iran. Um, all of these filmmakers are trying to produce a reality through film, and it's not unique to the post-revolutionary period um, to want to critique your society and represent it in a unique way for both domestic and international audiences. So with that, I will stop talking. And I will encourage people to um, write in questions. Very likely that I won't know the answer. It's fully possible, but I want to have that discussion um, now. Okay, um, folks, just before we get started with Q&A, can I just I ask people to um, use the raise your hand function in Zoom if you can, um, and I will unmute you so you can ask your question. Um, it does look like, uh, also just one more thing, please try to keep your questions brief. Um, uh, this, we're not going to do our um, thesis on, <laughs> on the, the philosophy of life here at our Q&A. Please just keep your uh, questions brief. And if you have a follow-up question, please say so at the beginning. Um, also, please state your name before you, uh, you ask your question. Um, before, Gustavo, we'll get to you in a second. First, we had a question go into the chat from Pune. Um, could you please talk a bit about a bit more about women directors, filmmakers, pre-revolution period, such as Foru Forosad and The House is Black. Are there any women who made award-winning films? That's a great question. So um, Furuga Farukhzad is 
uh, is far and away the most famous. Um, she also had a very short life. So she, she died only three years after making The House is Black. Um, she, I just saw uh, Behnaz Wright. She was the only one, one of a kind. I totally agree. She really was one of a kind. And if, in terms of like creme de la creme, who are you looking at? It's Furuga Farouksad. Um, but I will say that the post-revolutionary period does have many uh, female directors and producers. And that's one of the interesting characteristics of post-revolutionary cinema, that although before the revolution, um, we see a lot of like physically, we see the presence of a lot of women in ways that Westerners are, um, are familiar with, like unveiled women, they're wearing what they want. They actually didn't have a lot of power behind the scenes. Um, it wasn't until the revolution that you see women with more, um, more agency uh, getting involved in uh, film training. So I'll say that. That's, that's what I, I see a lot of questions, so I'm just going to keep my answers brief. Okay. So, Gustavo, I'm going to unmute you so you can talk. Uh, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Um, so uh, I'm from Brazil and I'm writing my master dissertation about uh, Iranian cinema. And I'm kind of struggling to find any information about the revolutionary tribunal that banned the movie Farsi Stars. And I don't know if you know something about it, but it would be very helpful for me. Thank you. That, yeah, that's a great question. So I know, um, I'm sure since you're writing your dissertation on this, I'm gonna tell you something that you already know. <laughs> um, I'm. <laughs> Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Pedro Patovi's work um, on film Farsi. I think he's like one of the few people who really takes film Farsi very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is I would, if you're interested in doing research on the way that um, the revolutionary period handled um, film Farsi stars, I don't do, uh, Gustavo, do you have access to um, newspapers like Etelot? No. So the University of Texas at Austin has a uh, full archive of Etta Laot since the 19, I want to say 30s, 20s. I worked, okay. with, I worked with the newspapers in the 20s. They have the, everything from the 20s uh, well into the revolution, so well into the 80s. There is a tremendous amount of material on what to do with these stars <laughs> after the revolution because there was a lot of anxiety, like can Gugush play in a movie? <laughs> after the revolution? The answer is no, but it took a long time to get to these answers. And there was a lot of public discussion about what the role of actors in the pre-revolutionary period should be in the post-revolutionary period. Um, so I would recommend looking at newspapers from the period and those are available. I know that they're available at Princeton and at UT Austin. So, um, and I know that UT Austin in case, um, if you're coming from, did you, where did you say you were from, Brazil? I'm um, from Brazil, yes. I know that UT Austin has funding for people to come and um, look at their archives. So I encourage you to, to write to um, actually my supervisor from UT Austin, Kamran Arai, and ask if there would be any opportunity to do that. Because I know Princeton also has um, uh, star magazines um, that might be very interesting to you to look at. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. And uh, now we have a question from Beirut and I'll unmute you. Go ahead. Beirut, I think you're still. Oh. Okay. All right. Uh, I've seen uh, filmmakers uh, of post-revolutionary Iran basically classified into two categories, the government mouthpieces and those who basically target film festival rather than make films for the Iranian people. What is your view on this take? So that to me is the big tension within Iranian cinema today. Um, so Cynthia, discussed an article that I wrote for Film International about um, the filmmaker Ebrahim Hatamikia. And I think he does a really good job of towing that line. So he's also very critical of these, of filmmakers like Abbas Kiorostami or, um, you know, any number of, of 
um, I could list, you know, almost all of them, he would consider uh, festival circuit um, directors. He would say that if your primary concern is introducing Iran to the West, then you're on the like festival cinema circuit. I think it's I, like, I understand that. And I think that perspective is very valuable. I was living in Iran when a separation came out. I didn't know anyone who saw the movie. There was like zero, I don't, maybe it was like where I was living and the people I knew, but there was zero interest in the movie. I went and saw several comedies um, that were also like social critiques of society, but they weren't introducing the Iranian court system they weren't discussing what divorce was like. They weren't going through the, the detail of the immigration process. That was information that for an Iranian audience, I remember my aunt saying, I already know all that, I've been through that. Um, I wanna see something that's sort of interesting and new. Um, I, I think that that tension is valuable to consider but at the same time, I think that they're all doing what needs to be done. Uh, in other words, there are lots of movies for Iranians in Iran. I mean, cinemas are packed in Iran because there's a lot that speaks to them. At the same time, the West does need to be introduced to Iran. So they are fulfilling a really important function. But I, I completely understand the frustration that like Ohata Mikia feels who for a long time was making movies about the war and about veterans. And these were not subjects that interested Western audiences. So even if the movie was very good, a, a, an American is not interested in the war. So it's not gonna get a lot of attention. Okay, uh, we had a question in the chat from Adam R. Adam, if I'm gonna unmute you if you'd like to ask your question live, go ahead. Uh, hi, Shaz. Uh, I, I think my question was very related to the last, the last question about pop culture cinema in Iran and wondering what um, is the, the kind of cinema that's being produced for Iranians within Iran right now and not on the festival circuits. But I, I do think you addressed that one in, in the last uh, response. Thank you. Sure. I will also say that Iranians in Iran love comedies. And that's not the kind of thing that comes to the West. <laughs> the, the movies that we get of Iran are very dramatic, depressing movies. Um, I, my experience as a young person uh, going to movies with my parents, Iranian movies in the kind of independent movie theaters that played international films was always so depressing. People were always crying. It would ruin my mother's day. You know, she talked incessantly about how guilty she felt about leaving Iran. Um, in Iran, people want to watch comedies. They don't need to be reminded of how difficult life is. They know. So I, I, that to me is the big difference. Shaz, do you want to, um, do you want to recommend some comedies just real quick? <laughs> um, you know, actually, I think this is uh, also a film circuit movie, but Honestly, one of my favorite comedies is Lizard, Marmulak. I think that's a great, great movie. And it, it is a social critique and it is all those things. But even in Iran, it's considered, you know, one of the best all-time comedies uh, from Iran. So I strongly recommend that. I'll also say that a lot of the comedies produced by uh, four Iranian audiences are, are bad. You know, they're um, just like how a lot of our romantic comedies are just like objectively bad movies. Um, a lot of those are bad, but that doesn't mean that popular audiences don't love going to see them. You know, that it has nothing to do, has no connection. The quality has no connection to the popular audience. I'm just going to interject a couple of my favorite comedy movies just Please. because yeah. I can. <laughs> so 50 Kilos of Sour Cherries, I love. Um, Pig, or also known as Hook, which is relatively newer, and uh, Max. Those are some of mine. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pune, it looks like we've got another question. If, let me, if I can find. I don't know if I've unmuted the right Pune. Um, yes, hi. I just um, thank you very much for your brilliant uh, presentation. Um, my other question was um, whether there were several, um, whether there is any film adaptation. Um, from novels uh, post-revolution because we have quite a few pre-revolution 
and um, oh, yeah. in the research that you did, whether you came across with any. Thank yeah, you. that's a great question. Um, I mean, uh, Sada Khedayat's work was adapted really beautifully um, in cinema before the revolution. Um, I actually can't think of any. I can say I'm thinking of a movie right now, and I feel bad that I can't remember. It actually ended up in a lawsuit that it was an American author who sued an Iranian director for, can, can Cynthia or Jeremy remind me, um, uh, an American author, um, who was the author who wrote, is it Frankie and Zoe? Um, I'm not sure. So anyway, an American author um, who is quite well known and uh, yes, Salinger, that's exactly right. Um, uh, <laughs> There was a, a book written by J.D. Salinger that was adapted into an Iranian movie. Um, now I'm, I'm looking it up. It's called Patty. And it ended up with a lawsuit. And basically the explanation of the director was, as I recall, there is no copyright in Iran, so what are you suing me for? Um, but I can't think personally of, a, of an Iranian novel that was adapted to a movie, but that might also just be ignorance on my part. Uh, we have a question from Fatima HZ, and you are unmuted. Hello, um, my internet connection might not be very strong, so I'm going to also um, type the questions here, if that's okay. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna... There you go. Oh. So, can you see them? Uh, not yet. I post them in the chat. Oh, okay. go, in the, go ahead and use the chat. Okay. I hear you pretty well. well. Yeah. Okay, then. Good. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much for the presentation. I have three questions. Um, the first one is, you refer to the cinema, the space at uh, Saltanez time as a dangerous space, considering yeah. that people of different classes and ethnicities uh, visited it. Um, why did you use the term dangerous? Great, great question. Actually, it's a topic that I wish I could get more into. So the first is it was considered dangerous because anything could happen. The lights were off. There's only a dim light from the screen and people could be talking to each other and they could be doing all kinds of things. They could be um, making plans afterwards. They could be illicit. There could be alcohol in their chai. Um, there could be anything happening. No one is like monitoring. The other thing I wanted to, I wish I showed images. Um, there are lots of great images of early uh, movie theaters from the uh, 20s, but this would have been true of, of, of Satana's period too. Um, people would bring their livestock to the theater. Um, children would be too eager to um, go to the bathroom. So they would, they would relieve themselves in the theater. It was considered very unhygienic, a very unhygienic space. People were eating and um, doing that. The other reason that it was considered dangerous was because anybody could communicate with anybody else. And Iranian society in the Qajar period was still very regimented in um, sort of who was uh, allowed to talk to, to whom. And um, Baha'is, Jews, Armenians, Muslims are all occupying the same space, enjoying the same things, and discussing these things freely with each other. And this was very dangerous. In fact, um, Mozaf Aradin Shah closes the first cinema house specifically because of that, because it was a mixed space. And clerics were very disturbed by the idea of, of both gender mixing and religious mixing uh, in spaces. So I would say unhygienic, um, dangerous in terms of the mixing. I'll also say that moviegoers themselves thought it was dangerous because they could not discern the difference between reality and um, the movie. So one of the very first movies that were screened was a train coming toward the screen. And moviegoers thought it was a real train and fled the theater in like a stampede. They were very scared, which is why they needed like a translator to explain like everybody before this train comes, it's not a real train. But they thought those things were very dangerous. So it was dangerous in a multifaceted way. Um, did that answer all of you? I see you had a three-part question. Oh, did that, 
Okay, so yeah, that was the, the second first one. Is if you could tell us more about uh, the persecution that directors uh, have faced, uh, especially post-revolutionary Iran, and the restrictions that female actors, actors, well, actresses face, uh, you know, after the revolution with regard to the you know compulsory hijab, the Islamic well, or state-imposed dress code. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for your great questions. So I'll just use Milani as an example. Milani was. Um, uh, harshly punished. Um, uh, there was a prison sentence. Um, Amnesty International got involved. Uh, there have been, and this was happening uh, kind of earlier. So um, now I think there's more care taken by the Islamic Republic because they know these things get international attention. Um, but she produced a movie called uh, Two Women in the late 90s, and that caused a lot of furor. Um, but it, I always, I sort of read a, the criticism as a frustration among Iranian men for being portrayed so negatively. So it wasn't just that she was saying, look at all the terrible things that women go through, but also just like, look at how terrible men are. And she herself is, is very critical of men, generally speaking. Um, I think I heard recently from a woman who gave a presentation at a conference about Milani that she said, the only men I think are, um, you know, serious thinkers or uh, legitimate influences in my life are men who were either educated in the West or have some sort of Western influence. Um, she doesn't have a very high opinion of men in general. Um, and is one of the very vanishingly few female directors who calls herself a feminist. Uh, Bani Antima does not. Um, so she's very unique in that way. But directors in general have been persecuted. I mean, house arrest, there was a very famous movie produced by an Iranian director under house arrest. Um, Iranian directors have been, uh, have left Iran um, to make movies abroad. I, I wanna also stress that some Iranian directors have been given permission to make movies abroad. And I also wanna stress that the movies that these directors are getting in trouble for were movies that were pre-approved. So all movies go through an approval process. So if they get in trouble, it's largely because of the reception. They didn't understand something. And then they hear the reception. They go, oh, that's what the movie was saying. That's a problem. Um, so that's, I would say, um, on the persecution front, your, your second question. Your third question, um, the scope of restrictions. So this is something that uh, scholars have talked a lot about, like the, the representation of women on screen that on the one hand, the veiling does one thing, which is a very sort of conservative force. Um, on the other hand, the veiling opens up a whole new avenue for women uh, and their representation on screen. So because you could no longer have the cabaret dancer and the prostitute and all those things, 40% of the representations of women were gone from the pre-revolutionary period. So now you had to represent women as students, as teachers, as civil servants, as whatever, as things that they were in life. I mean, the idea that 40% of women represented, that's so disproportionate, and this is not a slant at all on, um, you know, uh, there's actually a, a great movie about um, uh, prostitutes in Tehran made by a director by the name of Kamran Shirdel, and it was made before the revolution after the revolution, Khomeini wanted to show how bad the Shah was, so he let it out. And then in 1980, they decided, well, wait a second, this movie is about prostitutes. I should probably, um, I should probably pull the movie. It's, it's indiscreet, it's unethical. But um, the, there are great movies to be made about prostitutes. It's not to say anything bad about that, but it's very disproportionate to their population in, in Iran. And now because of, of the kind of ethical standards that are being forced, you can see a much more diverse experience of womanhood on the screen. That said, they cannot touch men. Uh, so many of the kind of acts of intimacy are gone. Um, they cannot, um, you know, they can't show themselves. It's extremely contrived you know you're watching a scene between a husband and wife and the husband wants to show intimacy and the best he can do is maybe put a necklace on his wife so there, are, there are all these restrictions um and uh those things are you know they're 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 realities of the movie industry in iran and it, it's very difficult to operate under those strictures no 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 question okay uh apparently there are a couple 
questions posted at the Q&A that we missed. Um, and we're starting to get a little low on time here. So I'll just read uh, one from Zahra. He said, would you talk a little bit about Afghan representations in Iranian movies? Uh, yeah, there's actually, so I have a colleague, uh, had a colleague at the University of Texas at Austin, who's now at UPenn, and he wrote his dissertation on Afghans and Iranian cinema. Um, there is a tremendous amount of representation and I'm, uh, it's part of this interest in um, the kind of um, working class um, perspective that became especially dominant after the revolution. Of course, Afghans are in a liminal state in Iran because they have no rights. They're treated abysmally. Um, nevertheless, uh, directors are interested in showing uh, just how poorly they're treated. There's um, a great movie, I believe, called Baran that I saw many years ago about, um, about this topic. There are actually many movies about Afghans. Um, in Iranian cinema. I recommend this dissertation. It's fully available online and it'll give a really good rundown of many Iranian movies and the kind of reasoning behind um, selecting those movies. In fact, er Afghan characters appear all the time in Iranian film, um, primarily because they represent something about both this large refugee class that Iran is unique in having. It's, um, you know, there are very few Middle Eastern countries that allow that kind of migration. Iran has allowed a very large migration of Afghans, but at the same time, they're um, not given any kind of citizenship status. So um, there's a very strong kind of forceful social critique that can be offered about it, which uh, Iranian film directors definitely take advantage of. And uh, there was one from Jeffrey Wall. What were the early topics, plot genres of cinema at the beginning of Iranian cinema? Comedy. It was comedy and it was um, um, the sort of shock and awe of, um, of uh, seeing things, that, modern things. So like turning lights on and off, seeing a train coming, um, maybe seeing things that only exist in, in uh, Europe. Actually, the very first movie that Mozaffar al-Din Shah saw at the Universal Exhibition was uh, footage of Africa, which like wowed him, couldn't believe what he was seeing. So there was some of that too, um, the kind of exotic, but it was mostly showcasing the modern. And also, of course, magic tricks that were magic tricks because they were on screen. All right. Um... I think at the, we're, we're 10 minutes over time, so I think we're gonna wrap this up. Um, I am posting in the chat, if you have questions that were answered, you can email them to the uh, Iranian Film Festival uh, Gmail account. And um, I can't guarantee, but we'll see if we can't get them answered for you. Um, so I've just posted that. I do want to remind people that on Saturday, we have a talk, oh, uh, talk or I'm sorry, a performance by violinist Nila Farhadi Sohi, who will perform works by young Iranian composers. She's uh, Sohi is a principal violinist with the St. Cloud Symphony Orchestra and was formerly with the Tehran Symphony Orchestra. So I will put a link to that in the chat as well. Um, also, just to let you know that there will be a recording of this talk, of Sherzad's talk, um, posted to the uh, posted to the website tomorrow. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, we hope to see you again on Saturday. And uh, <laughs> I also just want to say I added my email address to the chat site. Oh, if anybody wanted to reach out to me, it is such a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to present this material to all of you. And I'm so pleased that you guys were interested enough to go over time. That's like so pleasing to me. So, so wonderful, wonderful experience. Thank you guys so much. And I look forward to attending the events that you guys have organized. Thank you. Thank you, Chess. Good night, everybody.